And now it's my pleasure to introduce Brian Johnson, who, if you've seen his book up here at the table or read his bio, you'll know that he has a very particular interest in Cairn notes. And when I asked him about his pleasures on trips, they were all about that, all about the notes that travelers have left over time. And for those just coming in, if you just want to find your seats and give us your attention, <clears throat> thank you. Now, Brian's life is a lot about paddling, so I thought that you'd want to know if you wanted to go on a trip with Brian. He likes people who are really good at going with the flow. And although it might be difficult, no matter how long the trip, you should find a way to bring toasted bagels. <laughs> that is what Brian misses most on trips. And so now I'd like to introduce Brian Johnson. Good, good morning. And thank you, Jennifer. So uh, last night, somebody asked me, uh, or I or took notice that this was a canoe in event, and then I was trying to think really hard, do I even have a picture of a canoe in my presentation? I, I guess we'll find out. So I'm here to talk about messages in the uh, subarctic this morning. And just to orient ourselves, this is uh, Kerry Lake on the Dubois, is pretty close to the middle of the photograph there somewhere. So in case you don't already... Um, uh, no, this is uh, uh, Tyrell's Cairn, which is at uh, Kerry Lake, and I'm here to talk about uh, publishing the notes from that uh, Cairn. And in doing so, I, I ended up uh, taking the long way to publishing a book on that topic. So if we step back, you have to ask yourself, what is the problem? And the problem is that the notes have deteriorated. And why do we care? Well, we care for several reasons. We care because um, we've been there, maybe we plan on going there, and we also fantasize about going there. So there's a little part of the world and its history that may be out of reach for some people. So what does it achieve if we take the notes? And I'm going to argue that it preserves and it shares history. And what follows by taking the notes? And it's my journey to publish although it was never my intent to publish a book. That's just kind of what happened. So, here we are today talking about messages from the subarctic. I'm going to start to talk about cairns because uh, the notes were in a cairn. Then I'm going to talk about my motivation to publish, and I'm going to finish up with my uh, journey to actually publish the book. But first, a bit about myself. I like to think of myself as somebody who's optimistic. I like to help people. I like to show and tell advance like this gathering here today. And for some reason, I like the adversity of Arctic paddling. So you may be like me, or you may be a little more pessimistic, or maybe you prefer some other type of paddling, but I think we all share a, a love for the Arctic. So let's start with Cairns. If you don't recognize this Cairn, this Cairn is from Cambridge Bay. So I did a little research about Cairns, and I found out that Cairns, of course, is a, a Gaelic word, meaning a heap of stones. Its earliest word use was back in 1535, and it's a, uh, obviously a word from Scotland in the Highlands where they were a hunting and gathering culture where they moved from place to place. So as a people, they were very connected to the land and they had an intimate knowledge of their surroundings. So what kind of dog? Did you guess a Cairn Terrier? No. So named because its function, of course, is to hunt and chase quarry between Cairns in uh, the Scottish Highlands, but you know, I'm not here to talk about dogs today. If you know me, I'm not even a dog fan. <laughs> so Cairns, found all across the world, you know, from the far north to the south, to the east to the west, in the mountains, to the deserts, or the forests. This map is from 1897, and that's about the year that Tyrell built his Cairn from my opening slide. So for a long time, Cairns have marked um, trails, right, used as trail markers, and they lead to summits. Uh, and if you're going to build a cairn at a summit, of course, you're going to have to carry rocks up, uphill. And cairns are also akin to blazes on trails or on trees. And of course, we're used to seeing blazes like this to mark our portage trails. So it's uh, a form of communication. 
you know, a message from one person to another. It's a silent language. It may require some, no, some local knowledge. I'm sure we've all got lost trying to follow Karen's or, or Axe Blaze's. And even if you can't read um, them, uh, you certainly know you're not alone. You know somebody else has been there before you. So Karen's are those silent messengers uh, on the land or in the Arctic. And I, I snapped this photograph last summer when I was in a visitor information center. If you've ever, ever seen the poster, it gives us some idea into what those Karen's are. So that takes us north to a, a nookshuk, right, an Inuit stone cairn. And again, these cairns are going to pass on information about the landscape, convey something about root finding, or they might communicate stories about a place. And we've all seen cairns on our travels, you know, to drive caribou or to mark roots or grave sites and so on. And this is one of Tyrell's pictures from, uh, I guess, 1893 or 1894. And the Arctic, of course, is a cairn paradise. You know, the treeless land is abound with rocks, and rocks are known for their superior strength and for their longevity. Some rock piles look more human-like than cairn-like, and they all merit our attention. They draw us in, and they provide a rich connection to the land. And then cairns stand out in the land. And I'm sure many of you will recognize some of these um, stone markers from my last couple of slides from the Kazan River. And there's also hollow, uh, hollow cairns, right, such as a meat cache or a fox trap. And the old rule about the end products being greater than the sum of its parts certainly applies to cairns. This cairn is much more than a pile of rocks. Cairns are also perching sites for snowy owls or raptors or Lapland longspurs. And they're the home to small rodents and insects. I like to say that cairns provide a place for uh, things to rest, to poop, and to mate. They create wind shelter and shade. They radiate heat, which is kind of nice in the cold Arctic. And at the base of the cairns, always a good place to look for things, whether it just be little tufts of grass or flowers or plants or lichens but they all thrive around that little uh, microhabitat around a cairn. So cairns are not only part of the community in time, they actually create community. But cairns can also symbolize other things, something whimsical or something sacred or religious, or maybe their meaning is unknown. And cairns may represent bounds, and they may symbolize a place for reflection or for something like spirituality. So this is the Tom Thompson Memorial Cairn at Canoe Lake. And there may be mystery that surrounds his death, but he certainly remains one of the famous Canadian artists. So cairn building, is it a, a wind or a weather-bound activity? How many of us have built a cairn? And we've already seen uh, you know, in a previous presentation something about uh, somebody building a cairn. So, better yet, some of us have stacked up and, and built these kind of artificial cairns. So, I wasn't on this trip, uh, although somebody in the audience was on this trip. But uh, I've certainly stacked up boxes or pelican cases to make portage markers, uh, which of course look like cairns. And if you look in the distance, you can see that cairns keep you hiking and they entice you to that next rock pile, whether it be along an esker or, uh, in, like in this photograph, the next tundra ridge off there. Cairns are also reassurance markers. You know that feeling you get when you're out in the land and you think you're blazing a trail and then a cairn pops up? So I experienced this sensation on the trip when we took the cairn notes. We had portage out of the Kazan River and into the Ferguson. And every time I was unsure of which way to go, the little cairn marker would appear. Something as simple as this is actually from the Ferguson River. And then you know you're not alone. You're on the right course. But I'm going to wonder, with GPS technology, will future travelers no longer look for those reassuring Karens, letting them know that you know, others have been there before? So on the GPS technology thing, there's geocaching, of course. So now people can hide notes, and they tell you the location. And then with your GPS handheld device, it's going to guide you back to that note. So maybe we don't need Karens anymore. 
And of course, humans, we can't navigate like the animals or the insects, so we need cairns or some sign or some marker, such as the Cambridge Baylor Ann Tower. So I'm going to argue that you can think of this as a metal cairn. And when you're out on the land, it's a symbol of home, perhaps like the CN Tower. You can orient yourself by it. So seeing this, we all know where we are. So last summer, Cambridge Bay lost their visual beacon. The tower no longer guides travelers back from the land. Age dating a cairn is possible by several means, including by the, uh, using lichen or carbon dating or optical dating, something that you need to have a lot more knowledge than I do. But in the case of Tiles Boulder Cairn, we know it was built in 1893. So, of course, explorers have been using uh, cairns for a long time to leave a record of travel. I got a couple images just off the internet about the time that Tyrell was up there. Which leads us, of course, to expedition cairns, proof that you were there. So Tyrell uh, left a cairn, so that's his proof, right? So did Sir John Franklin. And I understand we're going to hear more about the search for Sir John Franklin later this morning. So in the discovery of new lands, people have frozen. They've uh, ate their leather boots for survival. Sometimes they were bored. Sometimes they got lost. And even sometimes they made their destination. And they would build a cairn and hoist a flag and say, I was there. Or even better yet, I was there first. And nowadays you can learn practical ideas. So I found this, uh, this book on the internet to help those embarking on a cairn building project. So if the vice, my advice is simple, right? If you're going to build a cairn, make sure it stands out. Think of the color and the shape and find the right capstone. Last summer we built a cairn when we ended up turning around and heading back and we walked the beach to find the right rock to put on the very, very top of it. Cairns are also trending and found in pop culture, or so I found out. So you can sign up for this monthly box of outdoor uh, products, a little subscription. And here's another example of how cairns have become a little trendy. So uh, a cairn, of course, is a pile of rocks. So simple, but so much more. This was a young guy we met in Cambridge Bay last, uh, last summer. And the essence of uh, cairns, of course, is to convey meaning. They become part of the landscape, part of the human culture, and thus part of us. So I've been talking about cairns, and I've, I did a little bit of research to find out something about cairns, so I read a book. And I used the internet, and of course, I pulled images off of my past trips. So let's move on to motivation to preserve the Karen notes. And the motivation is because there's more to know in a place than canoe and its rivers. And this was a quote that I read out of a, a book review of James Raffin's new book that he was talking about last night. So this is at K uh, Kazan Falls, a place where paddlers have left part of themselves in the Cairn Notes. And uh, the falls there is, um, there's a bond between those people and that place. Each rock, each cairn, and each note embodies some adventures and stories. The notes are both objects as well as stories. And we need to safeguard those past notes or those past stories and carry on the tradition of leaving new ones. I guess it's appropriate that the box there in the picture is an ammo box, which is a pretty good place to safeguard something. In the future, somebody's going to find meaning in them. The Cairns are just, at the moment, just they're note keepers. The notes in the, short, in the story should outlive us. They become artifacts. They reveal history of, of in this case, uh, northern travel. So Cairns may reveal information about scientific or historical importance. And they may give us a glimpse into the early days of Arctic paddling. This might be my only canoe shot. And this is, of course, from, uh, from Charles' uh, uh, trip in uh, 1893. So cairns become the usual places to look for messages. And as a result, they often get uh, dismantled. So this is Victoria, uh, or Victory Point. And uh, when they dismantled that cairn, they found one note. And that note had two messages. The first said, all was well. And the second said the ships had been abandoned and that Sir John Franklin was dead. I actually, as an elementary student, I went to the school called Sir John Franklin. And 
Not that many years ago, they tore down the school. So, Karen's link uh, travelers in stories, and they bond stories to a place. They gave meaning, and in time, as shown by Franklin and others. So there's some facts here. The notes were deteriorating. We care about those notes because maybe we've been there, maybe we're going there, maybe we're an armchair person, we fantasize about going there. So when we were at this boulder, I couldn't pass up the opportunity to take those notes and help preserve them. And our goal is to make part of this wor uh, world the history available to others. So my journey started with Tyrell, the legendary trailblazer. He mapped uh, the subarctic. So for two years, he traveled about 10,000 kilometers by canoe and by foot to put uh, those two rivers, the Dubot and the Kazan, onto the map. And of course, by foot, he ended up you know, at church when he walked all the way back to very close to where I live in, uh, in Selkirk, just north of Winnipeg. So our, our trip plan was a little noteworthy. We uh, decided to paddle across the watersheds, whereas most paddlers would canoe down the rivers. And we, we paddled in Portage, maybe plogged would be a good word. We headed eastward from Lynx Lake all the way to Whale Cove. And in the middle of the subarctic, and in the middle of those three big rivers, lies a cairn. So in 2012, I found myself in the middle of nowhere, at that Cairn Point, halfway between Yellowknife and Whale Cove, and halfway between Baker Lake and points North Saskatchewan. The red lines on the map are from a downriver trip, and the yellow highlight was showing our route options across those watersheds. So the Cairn's uh, quite a bit different than a lot of other Cairns. Of course, it's, it's on top of a big boulder, and unlike uh, our recreational trips, Tyrell was there on a working trip, so he was working for the Geological Survey of Canada. It was built a long time ago, 100 years ago, in 1893. And 1893 was also the year that the oldest canoe tripping camp in the world was established. The, the marvels of the internet, eh? So there we were enjoying a fine day visiting that uh, Boulder Cairn, and one of my tripmates says, the notes have deteriorated, we should take them and have them preserved. So they knew that because half of uh, the crew had been there before. In 2003, uh, two members had done the, uh, uh, the downriver route as shown here, and, and a year later in 2004, one of the other members had done a traditional Dubois river trip. So why had those notes deteriorated? Well, they, they lie in close quarters, dormant, right, cocooned and concealed in a glass jar, yet they're still very exposed. They overwinter year in and year out. They become sun bleached, much like you know, our life jacket would or, or our hair or our skin, and they get wet and soggy and moldy, just like my socks do or my rain gear. So we open the glass jar and some would argue we let the genie out, but many others before us, of course, have opened that glass jar as well. So once home, I, I, I got a hold of James Raffin at the Canadian Canoe Museum, as almost all the notes were from paddlers and canoeists. And James knew that the notes really belonged to the Northwest Territories, so he pointed me north to the Northwest Territories government. So in the Northwest Territories, the archaeological office, of course, is the Prince of Wales Northern Heritage Center, a great place to visit if you're in Yellowknife. And they were concerned that I had taken the notes. So they were concerned, of course, because notes and cairns are protected. So you should take photographs, record the location, and contact the Northern Heritage Center. So I was a little disappointed that they weren't interested in, in taking the notes, because I really didn't want the notes. I would have been happy if they would have taken the, the notes and put them into the archives there. But they asked me to put the notes back to where they came from. And because of my honest attentions, they said that they wouldn't lay any charges for taking the notes. So, our hope was that somebody would preserve them. So if it, the Northwest Territories was not interested in, then I would take on that task of preserving and sharing the notes. So after all, we wrote that that's what we would do and we wanted to you know, stay true to our intentions. And the Prince of Wales Heritage Center said that you know, we could publish a book. They were fine with that. But 
had we not taken the notes, what would have happened to them? And I think history makes it pretty clear. So Eric Morris writes in his note, in Arctic Cairn notes, right, that they found the tin out of the cairn, the contents had been scattered around the area, and he retrieved all the papers, etc. You can read up there. And then uh, I remember reading an, an article that Michael Peake had written in We uh, began Chiam, the so slog him north here reading. to the soon-to-be-named Morse River. We over began four long days, we fought over soggy barrens and river. through twisting streams. Over ending four on a stormy long days, we fought over soggy barrens and through twisting streams. As we ending sat on a stormy on night, ravaged tent finally with faces faces on the to morse. match. We passed around as a bottle of Corvosse, which Eric Morse had tent given us as faces to match. ammunition for we the We passed worst around a bottle of Corvosse, which Eric Morse had toasted given his us health and our ammunition good for the worst so alive and strong and satisfied. We toasted his health and our good fortune our to feel so alive and strong we and satisfied. We built the cairn the next day at the completion and visited it ten job. years later on the way out of another. We built the cairn mile the next trip. day. And it had been partly demolished ten years later plastic on the way out of another with a note likely trip. well digested. It had been partly demolished in plastic scat bottle along with the a note hills. likely well digested and scattered in grizzly scat along the rolling hills. So history is uh, it's it's laying the foundation here. The, the notes are not going to survive there. So let's go back to Tyrell's cairn. So in 1966, Robert Thumb's party opened the glass jar and they found water and a soggy piece of graph paper. And that was the 1955 Operation Thelon note. So in the 11 years since it had been written, one of the names had faded out completely. The name that remained was Neil Armstrong. Of course, Neil Armstrong is the you know, famous person, right? He walked on the moon. Maybe not the same Neil Armstrong, though. So I knew there was a history of publishing, right? There's Arctic Care Notes book, well-known pathers in there, people like Eric Morris, Pierre Trudeau, Gordon Lightfoot, the Duke and Duchess of York, and many people today who are in the crowd. And that's a very small format book, so I chose to do something a little bit different. I did a very large format book. And my goal remained unchanged. I was going to capture those notes before sending them back to the tundra. On the tundra, they were wasting away a bit, so we would try to perturb, uh, preserve and, uh, and protect them better than in a, in a jar with a rusty lid on them. The condition of the notes varied, but in general, they had uh, deteriorated. The note in the metal container was rusting. Many of the notes, uh, there was paper loss where they had been repeatedly folded. In addition to the paper loss, moisture had caused some of the ink to, to bleed or run. So this is the same note. I'll say it's been kind of reconstructed there. So it's a little harder to see the fact that there's a bunch of paper loss. But in the top right-hand corner, uh, it's dated it's July, July the 20th, 1969. And then in quotes, it says Moon Day. So of course, Moon Day goes back to the day the eagle landed on the moon. And Neil Armstrong, who we heard about earlier, stepped out and said, that's one small step for man and one giant leap for mankind. So back to the notes. Some of the notes are, are sun bleached here. You can see a, a glass jar is not the best thing for keeping notes. After all, the Arctic is the, the land of the midnight sun. The worst notes were pretty crinkled and in pieces, so it was a bit of a puzzle trying to put them back together. Some of the notes we weren't quite so lucky in terms of reconstruction. But th this one was able to get flattened out and reassembled. It looks much better here. It's still very difficult to read. Within that small frame, there appears to be four short names. And I was uh, out, with, well, out with a friend, and we were looking into, of course, one of our favorite books, Canoeing North into the Unknown, and there was one entry under the Dubont River that had four short names. And we're thinking, hmm, could this note be a match? So via the internet, I was able to track down two of those members who had left uh, this note, and they were able to confirm the year, which it's pretty hard to read in the note, I could only guess at it, and one of them had even copied down the text of his notes, so in the book that this transcription is actually complete. I also learned that double-sided notes are most difficult to read when there's writing on both sides of a piece of paper, especially if it's written in red ink. So it's difficult to see, but this note was also in pieces. So again, I, I tried to figure out who left this note, and I took my best guess at deciphering the, the canoeist names and locations. 
And then I, uh, I had our friend enter them into a genealogy database. And they were able to give me more current address information. So I looked up a telephone number, and I made that cold call. And a woman answered, and I asked, Hi, I wondered if you canoed down the Dubon River in Canada. And she said yes. She couldn't tell me everything about the note, but she did tell me the year of the trip and, and who, 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 the, who was on the trip. So another mystery is that glass jar. So before I sent the glass jar back, I tried to figure out its origin. I know it was there in 1966 by asking around, but it's not the sauce bottle that Tyrell left uh, in 1893. My research indicates that the, the glass was actually made either in the 30s or the 40s, and I think it was left probably between 55 and, and 66. So, it's a book, but it's, a, it's really more of a community project. So before returning the notes, I published uh, the version one of the book, I guess you could say, on waterproof paper. So I only printed three copies, and one's in the Arctic, one's at home, and one's in the, the National Archives. So I, I, I put the book and the glass jar, and then I, I got a, a waterproof journal for future notes and a protective case. And I think it's very fitting. We got a, a young group of guys to go take them back to the to uh, the Boulder Cairn. So this group of voyagers from Camp Widgee volunteered to act as the messengers, and they carried all those goods back to Tyrell's Boulder. So they're now sitting there waiting for you to go visit. And of course, we still wanted to, to share them a little bit more, so I looked at my publishing options, and it just seemed to be more in line to do a self-published book because of the community nature of this, what I'll, I'll consider a unique kind of special interest book. So self Publishing meant you, you get to stay in control, you know, you're in charge of everything from content to the layout to the printing and binding. And I, I kept it all say in-house, I had it all done, uh, you know, in Canada. And now I'm also in charge of sharing or selling to try to recover some of the costs. So self-publishing certainly comes at a cost, I had to make a lot of decisions. It took a couple years from start to print. Now I'm selling books and this is where you come in, because without your help, it's going to take the rest of my life to sell 100 books. <laughs> One note disclosed some personal information, so I, I asked permission of that pers to, person to include his note in the book. To ensure longevity and access, I sent uh, the book to the C Canadian uh, Library and Archives. So they've got copies there. So the notes in the glass jar, along with a protective pelican box and a journal for future notes, and a waterproof version of the book are on the land there waiting for visitors. And since it's been there, I've received word of new entries. Okay. So I've been lucky enough to participate in a few book exchanges with Skip Petzl and uh, John Lentz, and today I get to exchange another book with Jennifer. I've been experiencing the excitement of You've Got Mail and supporting Canada Post. People have written to say it's been a once-in-a-lifetime trip. Others they had mentioned that they had forgotten that they even left a note. Katie Her Hayhurst told me I found in a long, hidden, stored box which contained a movie. She's going to have that digitized. She also sent this note. I should probably know you better, but what the heck. So she sent me this uh, photograph. Now, I wasn't lucky enough to be there. <laughs> I'm sure that brings back from some memories if you were there in 1974. <laughs> this is the same group, just they're dressed up now. <laughs> There's been a long tradition of flags at, at the Boulder Cairn, starting with Tyrell. This flag was left in 74. Uh, Somebody wrote in, in the book that they had uh, restored the Union Jack. Last summer, there was that Australian flag was left. So, we've got a cairn, a pile of rocks, so simple, but so much more. My advice is very simple. Look for cairns, stop at cairns, and leave notes. I wish to acknowledge two companies that made donations. Wilderness Supply gave the Pelican box, and Right in the, way, right in the Rain donated the all-weather paper for the book as well as the journal. My talk has been about cairns as well as my desire to preserve the notes and my journey to publish. 
If you're interested in having your own copy of my book on top of a boulder, it's available at the book table up front here, or you can contact me and I'll mail you a copy. Thank you very much.